Now let me introduce you to Keith Boggs. Keith is the head of Real Momentum Ministries. He's going to tell us a little bit more about that, but uh, we are so glad to have you, Keith, and welcome, and uh, I'll hand it over to you. Hey, Ben, thank you so much. It's a blessing to be with everyone uh, on this call today. I pray God continues to use this Heart Cry for Revival Conference. Um, I was uh, attending one several years ago, um, and it was impactful for me, and I, I thank God for what God did that day, and it uh, really set me on a pattern of, of just to move to, to seek God's face in ways I never thought. I was hurting as a pastor, and it really was a blessing to have uh, just a great time with the Life Action Ministries and Heart Cry and One Cry and all those, those things together, so thank you. So I'm Keith Boggs, and I have a, a family that I love to lead and, and serve. And my wife, Nicole, we've been married 23 years, and we have uh, 10 children, that's seven girls and three boys, and we're expecting our 11th child in August of this year. And uh, one thing I recognize so much in my own personal life every single day is, is being a man and, and the vulnerability in that and the, the great need in that. So as I share today about uh, following God and leading men in revival, it's uh, something that's been a burden in my heart for well over 20 years and a personal journey. And uh, what I wanna just share with you is some things that we've learned, not only as a family, but also even as a ministry leader, uh, having pastored two churches, and then also working with churches uh, day in and day out, primarily with pastors and men uh, to help make men a priority in the disciple making ministry. It's been great to see what God's done in that. So thank you for jumping in here. I pray that God will use it. I'd like to pray for us and we'll, we'll begin uh, taking through some of the, the things I think they're important as we think about men, okay? Let's pray together. God, thank you for this time. Thank you for everyone that's going to participate today, not only in this breakout, but other breakouts and even what you're doing in, in a, a needed time of revival. God, I pray you'll bless and uh, help us to realize that men are critically important to what this looks like. And I pray, Lord, that uh, as leaders are on here and even people that will watch down the road, I pray, God, you'll give us clarity and vision and uh, really about your heart and following you, uh, making men a priority and leading their families and leading their churches and every other opportunity they have outside of that. So God, we love you. Thank you for loving us. Bless this time. I pray with your touch in Jesus name. Amen. All right. The, the passage I want to look at is Psalm 12 one, and it's really uh, the passage God used in my heart uh, in starting real momentum. And it's something I, I, I've always just since reading that verse, I'm on quiet time and journey. I've always found it to be the verse I go back to, and, and every time I go back to that, it just really solidifies what I believe to be a priority uh, for revival, and that, that is really making men uh, such a target and going after them, and helping them come alive as, as God would intend. So the scripture says, help, Lord, for the godly man ceases and the faithful disappear from among the sons of men. And there is a significant um, part that we can take from that, not only in the day and time in which it was written, but I think also in our day and time. And I just want to give you a couple statements before I, I give you four anchors to think about and even pray through, because some of you may not be uh, primarily connected to the anchors, but they'll be important for you to think through as you begin to ask God and see God as we all are for revival. I really believe that a spiritual reformation of a society, a church, a family, a community, uh, even America will not happen unless we make men a priority in that. And so uh, as far as the introduction part goes, I just want to give you some things I've, I've seen in my own personal journey and what we can do to, uh, to maybe answer those things that are, that are critical uh, to our day. Number one, I believe as we, we look at men out there, I believe that men are the largest unengaged people group in America. Um, having pastored, having been in churches as, as a member, um, most churches don't have a strategy or a plan uh, to even reach men. And, and I think part of that is because all, all the other issues that are going on in, in lives, we, we try to um, schedule everybody else and, and we just leave men into the last place. And, and primarily, I believe scripture puts God uh, number one. And then the order of divine order is that uh, the man comes into play. So I think the, the major challenge that I've been seeing as far as just asking, asking men questions and, and the conferences that we do and uh, some of the online stuff that we do, we, we, we ask one question and have asked this for a number of years is uh, if asking men this question, if you could, if you could just give us one word uh, to describe the state of men today in America, what would that one word be? And uh, several of them, uh, thousands of, of responses have come back, whether they're at a conference or uh, maybe I just asked somebody that question in a personal conversation. 
Uh, but there, here are some of the things that, that people are saying themselves, men themselves are saying about where men are. Some are saying that men are, are, are confused. Uh, we know that there's such a thing as toxic uh, masculinity being communicated today. So there's toxic is one word I oftentimes see. Um, discouraged is another word. Um, one, one word that really keeps coming up a lot of times is, is, is they're wondering, they don't know what to do. Uh, they're searching and, they're, and you know, they're stuck they're, they're, and many, many others. But those are the ones that keep coming back. And uh, there's a couple more that I think are important. One is complacent and the other one is passive. Um, so with that being where men are, um, I think if the International Mission Board or the Southern Baptist Convention or the North American Mission Board of the, of the, of the Southern Baptist Convention or any other entity out there that are trying to uh, be what they ought to be as organizational or de denominational leaders, if they came across a people group that looked like that, we would raise the money, raise the funds, find the missionaries to go reach a people group to help them. Uh, but these people are in our churches every single week. There are men uh, from all ages and stages of life. And I think it's important that we, we try to help and, and pray through some things that will help us make men a priority in, in trying to um, disciple them, equip them, and encourage them as spiritual leaders to lead uh, with the pastor and staff and elders and deacons and all that comes into play uh, to be the man God wants them to be, to help the church be what it wants it to be as the families are growing and maturing. So men are the largest unengaged people group in America. Um, my pastor is Johnny Hunt, used to be Johnny Hunt, and he made the statement several years ago, and it's so true every time he makes it at a men's conference. He said that men are the untapped reservoir of useful energy for God's kingdom. And that's not just a statement, that's a fact. And I see that in church after church after church in America. The second thing is this, the devil has a much more effective plan to reach men than in most churches. I'll say that again, okay? The devil has a much more effective plan to reach men than in most churches, and that's got to change. So if you look at the average church website, there's a lot of things on there for, for children, for students, uh, for women, uh, missions, and those kind of things. Uh, what we decided to do as, as, a, as a missionary ministry for men, we, we want to be intentional as a ministry. We want to be missional as a ministry. We want to be relational. And, and to, to reach men, you have to be all those things. Because men are busy, they have a lot they're, they're thinking through. They have a lot they have to lead. And so we're doing everything we can as an organization to even get men's attention. And a part of that means you have to be intentional. Um, I think uh, far too many churches have, have left men off their calendars. They're leaving them out of their budgets. And they're also uh, finding them being uh, left behind in their disciple making strategies. And I think that needs to change. So, uh, but the reality is the devil has a much more effective plan. I would simply say this to you, if you're a leader uh, on this call, or uh, maybe you have a, uh, a husband that's a pastor or a, a spiritual leader in your own home, uh, I would just pray that you would they that that the leaders of the churches and communities that we're a part of would not let another day go by without making men a priority because the clock's ticking and and the impact's being made as men make decisions whether they're godly decisions or not, uh, the impact is being made and that affects other people's lives. The third thing is this: ministry to men and through men in most churches is an afterthought, and and. That's being met with growing frustrations found at home in the church and around the world. Uh, unfortunately, in most churches, we're not developing men. We're not uh, discipling men. Um, we're playing catch up with men. And there's been times in my own personal ministry where uh, I've heard overheard conversations on the way into a committee meeting that, hey, would you would you mind serving as the as the men's leader this year? And that that's the answer on the way in. There hasn't been much thought or, or time put into that. No, no prayer, hardly or whatever which is a very sad reality of our day. The fourth thing is this, a ministry, uh, ministry to a man, or when you minister to a man, you also minister to his wife or his future wife. You also minister to his children or his future children or grandchildren, which means you touch his, his family, you touch his family, you touch all that he touches, you touch his church, you touch his community, you touch where he works at. I've watched men come alive in so many ways. It's been awesome to see them come alive as they've been made a priority and they get equipped they get discipled, they, they grow in their manhood, they understand what that means, and they come alive in a powerful way. And then number five, before I give you the four takeaways, which I think all of us can pray through, the fifth one is this, and uh, it's a statement by Leonard Ravenhill. He said, revival is costly. It'll cost you more to miss it than it will to find it. And that is a true statement, not only in personal revival, family revival, corporate revival, uh, a revival in America, in a country, or across the world. Uh, it, it's costly. It's going to cost us something. We'll have to make adjustments. We'll have to make, um, have to start some stuff so we can begin starting some things. And I think the major one would have to be men. 
And I would simply say it this way, a movement of men is costly. It'll cost us more to miss it than it will to find it. And so as you're on this call and we participate in maybe some Q&A at the end of this time, uh, I'd love to encourage you to, to make men a priority, whether you're a man yourself or whether you're uh, leading men or whether you're uh, connected to a man uh, through uh, maybe a father, maybe, uh, maybe a husband, maybe a brother. Uh, but men are critical, I believe, to a move of God, not only in their own families, but in the church, and I believe in the world. So we see that in Scripture, and the heart cry in Psalm 12, 1 is significant. The other passage I want to read before I give you the 12 uh, is Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 13 through 14 and uh, 19 through 20. Now, the, the whole thing about Nehemiah is um, he's 900 miles away. God puts a burden on his heart because of what he hears. He makes his way to uh, Jerusalem. And then all of a sudden, he's overwhelmed with what he's hearing. Uh, he, he goes through a period of prayer and fasting in the first chapter. Uh, God puts something in his heart, Nehemiah chapter 2, verse number 12. He even says, I, I told no one what God had put in my heart to do in Jerusalem. So he began uh, to feel God move in his own heart. And um, chapter 1, he describes himself that, uh, that he, has, he has sin in his own life. He says, I have sinned. He even says, me and my father's house have sinned. And so it really became a personal revival experience. And because God got a hold of Nehemiah's heart, he could touch the rest of the people. And I think that's the, the, the pattern I think we see throughout Scripture. Uh, the same is happening with Moses. Moses is begging. Uh, he's on top of the hill in, in Exodus 17. And so much is happening in the battlefield with Joshua. Um, and it, Joshua was even asked by Moses to go out and choose men, to choose men and fight. And that's what's really happening. There's a spiritual war going on. And wherever the spiritual leader is, primarily men, if men are falling down and not leading and can't lead, they're going to have a hard time leading their families or their church. And, and the impact will play out. Can God do things beyond men? Absolutely. But he, his, his pattern oftentimes through scripture is to touch a man and touch others through that man. And we see that in so many lives in the word of God. And so Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 13 through 14 says, I positioned men behind the lower parts of the wall at the openings, and I set the people according to their families with their swords, their spears, and their bows. And I looked and arose and said to the nobles, to the leaders, and to the rest of the people, do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord, great and awesome, and fight for your brethren. Fight for your sons. Fight for your daughters. Fight for your wives. And fight for your houses. Verse 19 in chapter 4 says this, Then I said to the nobles, to the leaders, to the rest of the people, it's almost like what I'm saying right now, I'm begging you to make men a priority. Nehemiah did this in chapter 4. Verse 19 says, the work, of, the work is great and extensive. So I would say it this way, ministry to men and through men with others in mind, women and children in mind, is very difficult and challenging. I think a part of it is because we haven't made them a priority. We haven't discipled them. And we're having to overcome a lot of things in our lives. And we can get more into that during the Q&A time. But the work is great and extensive. And we are separated far from one another on the wall. Just like many of you are on the call from so many different places. We're separated out there in this country or other places. And, and we need to focus on the call God has on our lives uh, as one. And, and, and I think the, the rally cry would be revival. And it, it happens when you begin to, uh, to see God work in your own personal life and even others' lives. And then he says in verse 20, this is where I think the key is. He said, whenever you hear the sound of the trumpet, rally to us there, our God will fight for us. And the takeaway I, I have had an experience in leading real momentum uh, for the last nine years is that when you make men a priority, God goes to work. And so the spiritual leader of a home, of a wife, uh, of children is a big deal to almighty God. He's the one that, that is the, the author of fatherhood. And so much taking place in fatherhood that really needs our attention. And I'll talk more about that as we go through the, uh, the, the four major parts that I think are important. So if you were to pray uh, for revival and following God in revival, I think I would give you these four things to pray about, okay? Number one, uh, pastor is the champion of ministry to men. Um, I think it's important that he, he makes it a priority. It doesn't mean he's participating in all that. So I would ask you to pray that God really begins to get, get a hold of the spiritual leaders of the churches in America that they would begin to have a burden for their own biblical manhood relationship with God. And then out of that, they would want to connect with other men to grow and develop as men. There is such a thing as brotherhood that we're missing in, in churches today. And I just think just that connection itself, men getting together with other men, seeking the face of God does do something special in terms of revival. 
And uh, I've watched it happen in, in, in city after city and church after church where men just rally together and God does, does something special. And the key to that is a pastor who, who has a heart for men, who's willing to lead men. That doesn't mean he takes on the whole responsibility, but he's making sure it has vision, it has value, and it has voice. And he's speaking into what's happening. He's the shepherd and he's shepherding that whole journey of men uh, with men. And it's a powerful thing to see happen. The second one is that you'd find a way to relentlessly teach biblical manhood until Jesus comes back. Uh, we can't assume anything in our current culture today with American Christianity, which is totally away from scripture and even cultural Christianity, which is uh, taking everything apart in scripture, it seems like. Um, this thing of relentlessly teaching biblical manhood is a, is a major priority. Most men I talk to, uh, and there are a lot of them, they've never been discipled. I was never discipled. So most of my journey was, was, was playing catch up. And I wish that didn't happen because if, if I'd have owned my manhood and, and really understood who I was made to be by Almighty God, it would have changed everything in terms of decisions that I could make. Um, I'm not saying I would have made those choices, but I am saying I, did, I didn't really know what that looked like. And unfortunately, the impact and the hurt on other people's lives because I didn't know uh, is very, very um, sad and, and, and oftentimes over hard to overcome without the forgiveness and grace of God. Um, one thing I would say out of that and relentlessly teaching biblical manhood, there's, there's really four things that we want to uh, try to help men see in terms of a vision. Number one is that uh, a man coming out of Genesis courageously follows God and his word. Uh, number two, he loves and protects God's woman. Number three, he excels at God's work. And then number four, he betters God's world, which primarily deals with fatherhood. And those four major things are, are taught through uh, a curriculum that we use called Better Man, which is written by Dr. Robert Lewis, and it's been very impactful. We call it a discipleship on ramp, which is 10 weeks where those men actually go through 10 weeks together with other men uh, in so many different ways. It could be live teaching. It could be uh, a small group at a home somewhere. It could be virtually. Um, these are opportunities that we're currently doing now in thousands. Uh, over a thousand men have gone through it the last several months, so it's been amazing to see that. But they're learning a vision. They're, they're becoming... Uh, alive and it's been awesome to see that happen with other men in different seasons of life different phases of life and it's been great to see that so uh, but the major thing is they're relentlessly teaching biblical manhood until jesus comes with the bible in their hand and they do roundtable discussions that go after that um, number three is you need to be intentional and relational with fathers and i really believe that there's there there is such a thing and, and i'm not not concerned about it but uh, I, I question some of the motives behind it but um, I think we will never reach the next generation without making the fathers of that generation a priority. And there's a push for next gen pastors and student pastors, which I'm all for. I've got children, so I understand all that, but I'm their spiritual leader and I, I'm, I'm responsible for them and I want to be involved in their lives. And I think every man does, but he doesn't know how. So if we develop and encourage men to be the fathers that God wants them to be and that they want to be, it'll make a big, big difference. Uh, but most of us are going out for the professionals and we're trying to hire the professionals to do what God called that man to do as the father. And uh, manhood is a critical issue to fatherhood. And if you don't know who he is or can't define who he is, he can't lead and direct others in the same way. So uh, it's not a dominating spirit that he carries on. It's a desperate spirit before Almighty God where grace has got to come in and he receives that grace to be what God would have him to be as he shepherds his family. And most guys have never been discipled in that. They don't know what that looks like. They're starving for that. They're hungry for that. But there's no intentional plan. One way I like to think about this is if there is a, a young man that comes on your church property, um, he's got a father wound or he's hurt because his dad's been absent, has never been involved in his life, and he's got that issue in his life. He's struggling, and he, he doesn't know who he is. Um, can your church help him become the man God wants him to be? Is there a pathway or a pattern for him to get right with God, to get right with his family, and to be able to work through the church with his gifts and abilities to be the man God wants him to be as a spiritual leader for one day of a wife, for one day of children that God may give him, for one day as a, as a community leader or a church leader, uh, whatever that looks like. So uh, there are several things in there that I would say about fatherhood that's missing in our churches today. It's missing in, in every part of the spiritual journey that we have. And I think that if anybody owns uh, fatherhood, it's almighty God. So why not seek his face that God would turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest he comes and strikes the land with a curse. And it appears to me that we're experiencing somewhat of that curse. And then number four, you want to reach and disciple or mentor the next generation. And so 
um, I would just encourage you to think about this. Uh, we help churches put this as a, as a pathway or a plan uh, in a one-year plan or two-year plan. We have a model that works. We, we have events that create momentum. Um, we capture momentum on the other side of those events that sustain momentum over the long period of time. And those capture moments are small groups of men. So you gather as many men as you can, you grow them as you can around the tables. They begin to grow, uh, go. And as they go outside that room or outside the teaching opportunity and teach their family and teach others, God does some special things. And before I, I finish here, I wanna read a testimony that uh, we've received uh, as a, uh, as a way to just encourage you and how a wife was impacted and really how uh, even the family was impacted because God got a hold of that man. And uh, here's the testimony. I wanted to share what a blessing real momentum has been in my life. I was going through a dry season. I was sitting watching my husband having life changing growth. Each Sunday he was having emotional moments during the sermon and it actually had me questioning my salvation. Why wasn't I feeling things so deeply? Watching him has challenged me to go deeper in the word. I see his daily commitment to studying God's word and his heart being obedient. And as I have increased the moment, and, and as I've increased the amount of time with my savior, what the spirit has revealed to me is I never had a salvation problem, but an obedience problem. My prayer life had been very shallow. Now I'm having revival in my own heart. With such emotion, I wanna shout for joy. Jesus is drawing me closer and calling me higher. Watching my husband step up and lead our family is humbling and awesome. I praise God. My walk with the Lord has grown so much deeper because of my husband's walk with the Lord. My heart wants to follow and serve my husband like never before. What an incredible ministry. We are forever blessed. What a great savior and a mighty God we serve. And so again, when you touch men, you also touch others. And the wife was touched because we made men a priority. And this man came alive and he began to lead his family and God's moved powerfully, not only uh, from that time. And I know this man, he's a great man of God and he's written through the entire word of God by hand. Uh, 66 books of the Bible to give to his children. He leads family worship. He leads other men and disciples other men. But he was in a church just sitting in the pew. And he knew deep down that God could do so much more within him. But there was nobody around him to help him be that man until he got connected to, to another man, got connected to other men, and the rest is history. So I believe we can follow God in leading men, and God can change the world as we seek God for revival. Thank you, Ben. Amen. Thanks. Thanks, Keith. That was wonderful. I've, we've already gotten one uh, comment in uh, from one of our participants, and they said that is uh, the verse you referenced said that has been my verse since the early 90s when I started a donut ministry. Many women came to church without their husbands, so I took donuts and juice out to the house and met with the men. So uh, great ways to reach out to others. At this time, if you have any questions, you can uh, put them in through the, the chat function. And uh, we'll be able to ask those to Keith. Uh, if you have any questions about how to uh, how to get involved in ministering to men in your community, what can you do? How can you pray? Anything along those lines, uh, feel free to to add those in, and uh, I'll wait on those. And uh, here comes one. What is the name of the men's Bible study again? And who is the author? I believe that was Robert Lewis. Yeah, it's called uh, Better Man. Robert Lewis is the the author. Um, the way it's designed to be used is that we're, there would be one live teacher um, teaching men. And so the men form tables, which the strategy that we've been using for years is you get two men who are seasoned men of God to go after uh, men under 40 primarily. They go after men under, under 40, and they will actually um, walk with those men for uh, 10 weeks through something called Better Man. And this is all new content, but it, we call it a discipleship on ramp. And uh, it's been very impactful where men really see some things in their own lives that, that they need to deal with. Uh, one thing I've been saying about this content, I've taught it several times now and actually done several Zoom meetings with it. We're offering right now in our own ministry. We're having several groups that are doing it right now virtually through Zoom like this. And um, I just found out that the churches are crying out for vision. They're crying out for where the church is going and, and what the church is doing. But uh, that man that's out there in that pew can't even hear them because of what he's dealing with every single day. He can't even get up off the bed without facing what he's facing, uh, maybe in his past, maybe he hasn't been forgiven, maybe he's got a father wound or some unprocessed trauma, whatever that would be. And he can't even hear what the, the pastor is asking him to do because of, of the challenge he's facing 
And so this helps them unpack that. And then they, then we begin a discipleship process in week 11. And uh, we're just watching men come alive everywhere and their families are being impacted. Their churches are being impacted. And it's been awesome to see. Praise God. That's awesome. Another question just came up in a, a, one of our participants is asking, could you quickly repeat the four items for relentlessly teaching biblical manhood? Yes. And it comes out of better man. The first one is a real man courageously follows God and his word. So that's the true north. Once that man courageously follows God and his word, everything can change. And so we start with that. I believe primarily that ministry to men begins with almighty God. And then it goes out from there. So he's got to courageously follow God and his word. A real man also loves and protects God's woman. Uh, that could be his wife or his, his future wife uh, primarily, but it also means his mother, um, his daughters. And um, it, it could also mean, I would like, we oftentimes teach on the church. Uh, that, that's the bride of Christ. And most guys, um, unfortunately, they're not spiritually connected to their church. They just attend and they're not really uh, engaged at all. And so he loves and protects God's woman. The third one is he excels at God's work, which means he, he's been created to work. Uh, and we teach from that, that men, um, when they go to work, it's actually, it's worship. And they're connecting to God. They're, uh, God's using them. And what do they do? They do hardly as unto the Lord and not unto men. And, and God's using that, that place of work. And we've watched men, uh, primarily in South Georgia, a businessman actually offer uh, a men's ministry opportunity for men. We've seen hundreds of guys come to this gathering and, and they, they're, they're men that aren't even connected to a church and they're coming to be equipped in, in biblical manhood and they have no idea what they're participating in. Uh, but God's saving them, God's uh, developing them and growing them. And that's one of the most powerful things I've seen. All because a business leader said, I'm going to excel at work and uh, make and touch my men. And then the last one is a, a real man betters God's world, which primarily deals with fatherhood. And then it takes a missional approach uh, to help those children who don't have a father. In other words, they, that's checked out. He's an atheist or he was abusive or he's alcoholic or uh, apathetic or whatever that is. Um, that those men take on a missional approach to go make sure the next generation has, has the chance to become godly women and godly men. Amen. And uh, we have, we have another question that's just come in. Keith, if our church is super small and I'm a new pastor here to help revitalize it, can we jump on with one of your better man cohorts or is there uh, is there another one that going on that they can join and uh, should they, or should they start their own with a few men and, and that pastor being the only leader question mark? Yeah, I would say that um, you can, you can contact me offline if you want to, but I, I there's a, the better man website is called betterman.com. You can start there just to go, go do some research on that. Uh, we, we have about 25 leaders right now that are, that are doing groups. If you want to jump in that group, you can also connect with me and I can get that information to you, uh, how to do that. You can go to realmomentum.org slash groups and you'll see how that's laid out. Uh, but we're, we're uh, what I would say, if you have a burden and it sounds like you do, um, I, I would start to find other men that may have a, a similar burden to touch men. Uh, that's how that group forms. And then out of that group, it just grows. And uh, we watched uh, so many lives change because of what God's doing in that. Great. Thanks. Uh, any other questions? Uh, we'll give you just a moment. All right. Well, Keith, we want to thank you again for joining us and leading us during this time. And yes, it was realmomentum.org. And uh, I'll put that link back up real quick, but uh, you'll be able to find more information from Keith. Also, uh, he has plenty of uh, other material that you can use and you can invite him to uh, come to your church, all kinds of things. And uh, looking forward to uh, seeing what God continues to do through your ministry, Keith, and, and uh, as your family grows. Hey, thank you. And, uh,